turn it out. Okay. Uh, who was not at the Barcelona Guillotina presentation? Okay, just a bit recap. Um, three years ago, uh, we started to do something that we named Plone Server. Naming, it's always difficult. And <laughs> uh, we tried to, um, to push um, a synchronous mode to see what, what we can do. We meet in Barcelona, 15 Plone developers. We try to do what we can do to rewrite from scratch backend uh, using ZooDB and everything else. One year later, at uh, Cologne Spring, we decided to rename it and to rename it to Guillotina and to use uh, Postgres database uh, directly. And we are here now. So now, uh, one year later, after Barcelona Plan Conference, uh, Guillotina is really stable, really mature, and I'm. I will be really happy to explain what are what is now and what is going to be from our point of view. So, first of all, who am I? For those of you you already did the presentation. I'm co-author of Guillotina, Plum Foundation member, ISCAR founder, and uh, entrepreneur. I like to start new companies, and I'm a full stack developer. And I'm also a magician, a dancer, and mostly a Catalan over everything. So, what is Guillotina? And well, I try to uh, do a uh, to write a sentence. Um, it's an ecosystem. It's not a framework. I like to to repeat that a lot of times. It's not that it's one package that it's Guillotina package. It's a bunch of packages that are creating a, uh, an ecosystem of packages that are used to work together and to, they are designed to scale and to manage resources with security and a traversal storage. That's the, the main um, goal of, the, um, of Guillotina. The um, two main authors and main contributors are uh, Nathan and me, and uh, he was, he's not able to be here, but he sends uh, his in, in the slides a lot of time, so uh, I really want to mention him because we've been working on this for the last two years together and it's been a pleasure. And most of the ideas are just uh, he and me discussing, discussing and deciding what to do every time. So before starting, this is going to be a, a code uh, talk and before starting with the gray slides, I wanted to do a bunch of colorish slides. And this is the, um, my dream of what is Guillotina, or what I want that uh, Guillotina becomes, and what is it right now. So first, we wanted to, to be something that it's easy to use, besides it's a sync, and you need to write a sync and await all the time, sorry for that, uh, that allows to develop ideas that are scalable and extensible, with options to grow from one user to thousands. We had a use case. We were working on the same company, and we had a use case where we needed to grow a project from a really small use case to a really large use case with lots of users and a lot of data. Uh, we wanted to have uh, a pipeline of uh, components the, um, to host resources. Uh, resources is the name we use for what Plum calls content. And to split in a smaller pro problems, something that it may be a really complex problem from outside. Um, my uh, dream here is that everybody could use this to deploy large systems, to iterate and to deliver fast, mostly designed for startups where they start with a really small prototype and they need to grow, grow and grow, uh, adding new users and new, new resources. That is always community driven that no company belongs, uh, has the, pro, uh, the IP or the rights on the, on the software. It belongs to the Plum Foundation, and I'm really happy about that. And trying to keep it simple and small. As you see, my dream is not to replace Plum. So um, it's not a tool to replace Plum, to, do, to replace the backend of Plum. It may become, but it's not why we created this thing. We created this thing to be uh, a tool for creating projects because it's the most asked question. So let's start with the technical uh, side of the, um, of the presentation. First of all, 
uh, Guillotine is based in, in Plumgrass API. That thank you to Timo and all the team that was building that. We define it, uh, this API uh, or as the entry point. It's a valid API. It's a good API to manage resources and to manage content. And well, it was easy to implement the backend with this API because we also are traversal and it's the main um, request for this, this kind of APIs. Then for the storage layer, the, here after iterating over different databases, we went through MongoDB and we went through um, Red, even Redis we tried. Um, we decided that the best database that fits our needs for the transactional model and for the kind of way we were willing to interact with the database layer was Postgres and later on appeared CockroachDB. I don't know if you know, CockroachDB is an amazing database built on Go. Uh, it, in, it talks the binary protocol from Postgres, so you can connect anything that you can connect to a Postgres to CockroachDB. And it uses a raft consensus algorithm in order to distribute the data across different nodes with replication. And we have, we, uh, we've been having some deployments with nearly, I don't know, 1,500 uh, requests per, um, transactions per second with all millions of documents inside the, 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 the database. So it, it performs really well. It's a bit tricky. But and it's new, so you need to follow up the the book fixing and the, the versioning. But it's a really really amazing database. And from our point of view, we ne we only needed to change just a few amount of things because talks Postgres binary protocol. For the indexing, indexing the content and being able to search and do full text searching, we uh, choose Elasticsearch. That we kind of like it. And we also are providing support for Postgres JSON B, uh, so we can serialize on the on the Postgres uh, JSON as a JSON B field. On the catch layer, we are using Redis and uh, memory catch. It's a really small memory catch, uh, and it's mostly everything delegated to Redis, which is doing the invalidation. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. And about blobs. Um, so we decided to, you, to um, choose S3 and Google Cloud Storage as um, the main um, citizens of blobs on Guillotina. We, as it, everything is in a sync uh, framework, uh, we are able to stream files up and down to S3 and Google Cloud Storage, so we don't need to host the file in memory uh, ever and we are just streaming from the web browser or whatever client you are connecting to Guillotina to the, the real storage. And we, are, we only have a buffer of 500 key kilobytes, and we are just streaming the file up and down. And oh, we also support database blobs that uh, Cockroach and Postgres also has in case that you don't want to, to use a, a cloud file storage. Well, <clears throat> these are the layers, the main layers that we needed to choose to, to uh, reuse the tools that we have uh, already, already stable on, on the ecosystem. But now let's go to inside the, um, the Guillotina com architecture. I just pick from Guillotina the most interesting um, concepts, and I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm going to try to explain a bit all of them. First, the configuration. Uh, we kind of decided that we don't want to store the configuration on the database, so everything is explicitly uh, configured externally to the database in a YAML that you can provide when you are, uh, you are starting Guillotina. This um, config.yaml that you are sending may overwrite any of the configurations that you have on, on your system. And what we do is we merge this configuration with all the configurations from the different packages that we are loading on our system. All this information can be accessible from the code when you are importing app settings from Guillotina. So you, here you get a large dictionary that with all the configuration that you have for your, for your site, everything, uh, um, the Elasticsearch URL, the database URL, anything that you need, it's going to be on this large dictionary. 
decorators, because maybe we suffered a lot about uh, GCML, we decided to to move to the um, to the pyramid way of defining um, the different elements that uh, developer needs. So we have uh, a long list of decorators to define nearly everything that we think that it's needed. So the first one, configure.service, it's to define an endpoint. You want to define an, um, an endpoint for a specific kind of content, this one. You want to define a new content type, a new resource type, second one, a, voc a vocabulary, a behavior. We implement behaviors as a first-class citizens of uh, Guillotina. Uh, Add-ons, if you want to uh, register an add-on to be in able to be installed. Adapter subscribers and utility. Uh, different languages. Uh, either, even the permissions, the, the rules, granting and granting all can be defined at, uh, as a, um, with this decorator. JSON schema definition, it's a way that uh, all the input output from the API is, is done with JSON. So we needed to find a way to be able to define uh, pieces of JSON that are going to be reutilized in different places of, of, the, of the response. Value serializer and value deserializer are two um, decorators to define how you want to serialize and deserialize a specific field. Imagine that you have uh, an integer, how you want to serialize that on JSON, and from JSON, how you want to convert that to, to the value that we're going to use. So you can uh, configure your own uh, for your own uh, types. And renderer, uh, right now there is only one render register, that is JSON, but we are working on having more renderers to be able to convert um, any internal structure to protobuffer or any other kind of uh, format that you want to use. More things. What happens on Guillotina when we are running Guillotina? No? So the first thing that happens is that we register all the configuration, the merge that I said about the, uh, all the dictionaries of configuration. Then we uh, register all the adapters, events, and utilities that uh, Guillotina has out of the box. Then we scan all the packages that are on the key applications on app settings. That means that if your application is not listed on this uh, uh, key, it's not going to be loaded. Then we copied from Pyramid also, uh, the include me uh, root function that you, we are calling on, on the package in order to do specific things that that package needs to, to do at bootstrapping them. We register all the adapters from this uh, internal package. Then we load multiple databases. This is important. Um, Guillotina, you can uh, define on the configuration file multiple databases that you want to load. And you can also add um, new databases uh, when the application is, has already started or remove them. Then you configure a static folder and JavaScript apps folder. These two are for uh, static files, clear? And JavaScript applications. JavaScript applications is, uh, you know that single page app needs to have this wildcard routing that everything that it's from one point to, to um, um, as the children of that point are going to be needed to be rendered as the same application. So we created this kind of um, mapping where uh, everything that you are pointing is going to render the same JavaScript uh, file. So we can serve one page applications without uh, engines or anything else. We just need the guillotine. Then we create an error, uh, an error CK, um for, for, for generating, uh, creating tokens and load the asynchronous utilities. I'm going to go there later. Security policy. Um, well, the, like Zope, similar to, similar to, to what Zope is doing, um, we have the code configuration. It's the, um, the, the permissions and roles that we, we write down on, with the decorators that I explained before. The user provided global configuration so maybe we have uh, a user that it's manager. So this information comes from the, the user information. 
And then we have our uh, local uh, security uh, policy. It's quite similar to the, to, the <coughs> to the Zoo one. So you have roles, permissions, and principles, and the combination of all of them uh, linked to users and groups. Maybe the difference from the light, latest versions of, of Zoop is that uh, we have something called allow single, which uh, means that a specific, uh, if you give a permission on a specific node on the tree, this permission is not going to be inherited in the children one. So you can assign it. This, on this specific node, um, I want that this user is manager. So the, the children of this um, node, is, uh, this permission is not going to be inherited. You can also deny or unset. Guillotina is not <clears throat> opinionated about users. Doesn't have nearly anything about users. There is only one user, is the root user, nothing else. Why? Because we wanted that anything that uh, provides a user information, groups, or uh, permissions is delegated to another package that can implement maybe, I don't know, uh, an OAuth system or whatever. So, so we needed to create an interface in order to extract and validate the credentials from the user that is connecting and to get the user that is connecting to the system. Uh, first, we get the credentials. We have provide bearer support, basic support, a WebSocket, a WebSocket token, and cookie. So we can extract the credentials from any of these systems. Then we can validate. We have a JSON web token and salted hash. And finally, uh, we get the user. We have only the root user on Guillotina, and then we have three different packages that provides different um, database databases that provides users. For example, Guillotina DB users stores the users as uh, content. So you, each user, it's the membrane project from Plone a long time ago. So it's the same thing, but um, really simple. Either IDP connects to um, an OAuth to a provider that it's written in Go, that you can deploy on premise, that it's really cool. And authentication provides uh, um, delegated authentication with Twitter, Google, Facebook, and all these kind of social networks. <clears throat> More things. Special permissions that we have. Well, first, access content. We created this permission uh, that is a bit controversial because we wanted to make sure that a user is able to traverse to an object. So Guillotino doesn't implement the security proxying from Zoop. It's not wrapping the objects in a security model that you make sure that you can access or not a specific field or uh, do whatever with, a, with, a, with the object. So our protection of the, of the specific object, it's done at the traversal time, just making sure that you can access to this object with the access content permission, and then the view permission that you specifically need to run the, the view. So if you want to modify, you want to add, you want to delete, whatever. So you need to have, in order to edit specific content, this content needs to have access content and modify content. Another per, a sp a special permission that we have on the system, it's mount a database. So you can dynamically decide, I want to mount this Postgres that it's wherever on this guillotina, or I want to do um, mount a file system um, database. There is another permission that it's get API definition. Uh, all the, all the endpoints, as it's based on completely a REST API, we are not rendering anything on, on Guillotina. It's just providing REST API responses, a permission to get the, the API definition, and Guillotina public to have a, um, anonymous can access to it. Well, resources. <coughs> Whoever is used to Plone, knows that uh, Plone has um, dexterity content types and behaviors. 
and you have a large dexterity content type and some behaviors that you, you are applying to, to it. We decided to copy more or less the same idea, but adding something new. It's called dynamic behaviors. The behaviors that Plume has is what we have here called static behaviors. It means that on the class, when you are defining the class, you are saying this class is going to have this amount of content, this amount of behaviors. But dynamically, when there is an instance of that class running, you can de decide to apply a specific behavior on that instance, and it gets added to the, to the index. Also, if it involves adding annotations or whatever. So you, you can have objects that has the static behaviors, and suddenly you want that it has an attachment. So I add the behavior of attachment, or I add a behavior of doubling core, whatever. Fields. Um, well, we support most of the uh, Zopa schema fields. Um, the only one that it's uh, noticeable here is cloud file field. This is a specific uh, field which, um, depending if you have uh, S3 uh, storage or uh, Google Cloud storage installed, it will store the file on the database, on your local Postgres, or on a Google Cloud, or on S3. It, it, you just always use this field, and depending on what you have installed, it's going to use one support or the other. And we have some more kind of hacky fields, no? One it's called dynamic field behavior, and this is what we call through the API, new uh, fields that get indexed. It means that, imagine that you have a, um, that you want to have a, I don't know, a mosaic kind of be, um, layout where you are defining new fields and you are defining these fields, and you want that the, the content of this field gets indexed. So when you're searching on full text search, you are also finding the content of these fields that you are creating. So we created this behavior where you can create uh, any kind of fields on a, on a behavior, and then gets automatically everything indexed. JSON field, it's easy. You define the JSON field with a JSON schema, and you, you can push any JSON data that it's validated by the JSON field. Bucket field, this is um, a need that we had on the last project we did with Nathan. Um, sometimes you have an object that is really, really, really large. Imagine that you, you want to store on, um, on, an, on a node a conversation that you have on a Slack no? For, forever that maybe it's kind of millions of messages on, on the system. No? And you want to store all on the same object instead of nesting them on children. So we created something that it's able to um, group um, 1,000 sub-objects inside an annotation and link to the next one. So we have a pointer to the first and to the last, and we can go through the history of that large list. It's, uh, it performs really well, and it's mostly designed to, to really long um, um, objects that you want to store on one object. Patch field. This field, <coughs> it's, it's really not a field. It's a wrapper of a field. You use that as a wrapper of a list or a dictionary or uh, an integer, for example. And it means that in order to interact with a field through the API, I don't know, uh, Timo, do you know if Plum REST API supports patch operations right now? Yeah? No, no, no patch in terms of the verb, patch in terms of the JSON, that you, can, you have a list on a field and you just want to add one element on that list. It's hard coded. So th this, this is a way to, so you define the field saying, okay, this field that it's a list, Instead of, if I want to interact through the API, uh, I don't need to send again all the list if I want just to delete one element or add one element. So you can define operations onto other existing fields, and then you just need to say, I want to append and this value. 
and then automatically uh, Python is able to just append this element on, on the list. You don't need to send again on, on the API. And we also implement it for integers if we want to increase or decrease the integer value or reset to the default value. Storage. Well, um, this is just, I'm trying to go over everything, maybe too much, but um, it just to talk a bit about the storage layer. <clears throat> this is the schema that we have for the database. This is how we are storing everything on Postgres and CockroachDB. And mostly we have two kind of records on the SQL, SQL schema. One is the main object, meaning the object that is going to be on the tree. And the other one, it's the annotation of one of these objects. There is only the, these two kind of objects. The first element, the first column, it's uh, this, um, the object ID. I'm kind of romantic, so we maintain it a lot of names from, from Zoop to, to make it friendly. Transaction ID, in order to, uh, when we are in the voting phase, uh, which is the size of the object that we are serializing. Part. Part is a specific column that we are using when the size, uh, when the size of uh, the guillotina grows a lot, which uh, can be defined with an adapter. It means that you can define uh, if one object goes to one partition or another partition of the database. Postgres 10 supports uh, automatically partitioning of tables and uh, mapping all of them in one view. So this is used for that, um, that triggering uh, on, on Postgres to split the data across multiple tables and to be able to scale on Postgres. Uh, resource, it's a Boolean that just shows if it's a resource, meaning a main object or um, a notation of, it does the reference to the, um, to the object ID in case that I am a notation. All transaction ID is the previous transaction ID. Parent ID, it's used for the main objects to know which is the parent, the ID. It's the, the ID is the real ID, the ID that we have on the URL. We wanted to serialize as a specific column. Type, what kind of uh, con uh, resource is it? A JSONB field that we are mostly using on if we are doing indexing on the, um, on the database, and the state that it's the pickle of the object. Okay, we have also a registry. Um, you can access request.container settings, um, register an interface, and get and set the, the value of the field. No, no strange things. Async utilities. This is something that uh, I really like, is that you can define utilities that are going to be bootstrapped at bootstrapping time and are asynchronous utilities, so you, they can run forever doing uh, any input output operation that you need during the, the, the cycle of the of life of the, of the process and it's going to connect to different systems if you need. For example, this is a stupid use case that it's a workflow utility, and we provide, we define this on the, um, on the config.yaml that we want to load that when we are bootstrapping. Then we define the utility, <coughs> just inheriting from iasing utility, and configuring the utility that provides this utility. And then we have these two specific methods, initialize and finalize, which is going to be executed when we are starting and when we are shutting down the process. And both are synchronous, they have the, the, the generic loop, so they are able to do operations like, I don't know, give me the credentials from Google Cloud Storage, or, con or make sure that everything is clean on the database layer, or whatever. And then on the code, of course, we can also get this utility whenever we want using the standard get utility. Well, 
the view. At the end, is what's important. I think uh, I wrote three examples of, of view definition. <coughs> it's using the decorator configure.service. And here, uh, you define which is the context, which is the resource interface that we are going to apply this, this endpoint, which is the method, which permission is required to, to execute this, uh, this view. Then we have the endpoint. In this case, you see that we have um, you also your URL dispatch inside the, the endpoint. So you can parameterize with multiple levels the, um, the endpoint inside the, the view to give kind of uh, tr the traversal, the published traverse method on, on Zoop, publisher, to, so to be able to go into uh, different levels. Uh, summary and responses. Most of the calls from Guillotina <coughs> have a lot of documentation on the definition of the, um, of the service because we provide a swagger out of the box. So all this information is serialized on the swagger information so you can check all the endpoints and make sure, try them out and know which are the values that you need to send. Then you have the class where you have the request and the, and the context. <clears throat> this is another example. This, the um, the speci uh, special thing about this example is the allow access true. This is the only way to skip the access content check on the traversal. So you can define, okay, I want to allow to access uh, to this view no matter if the user has access to the content that it's going to be access. For example, the login endpoint needs to have this, this, otherwise you're never going to be able to call it. Well, another example of how to do the, um, the explanation about uh, responses. So when we have a 200, we are going to receive something that it's a schema, that it's a reference to something we call application. And we define it application with that um, decorator I explained it at the beginning, where you're defining JSON uh, blocks. Well, the, the flow of the request is quite simple. We just do the traverse to the object, we check access content, we look for the view, we check the, there is some language, um, the language translation mechanism that we check if you, you're looking for another language to get the multilingual idea, it's already implemented. Um, we check the permission, the view permission, we execute the view, then we do the commit or the abort, or, and we do the post commit operations. And one really nice feature that we are using a lot is that if you need to do something when this is already committed, so maybe, I don't know, logging or on some st stupid place in a synchronous way, we, ca we have the features, we can, you can define multiple features on your view that is going to be executed after the commit. And this is done after the response has already deli been delivered to the client. So maybe you want to lock something on lock, uh, lock stash or whatever you, you, you need to do any kind of after commit operation <coughs> that the user doesn't need to know if it worked or didn't work, didn't work it, so we can register all of them in the features. Cache invalidation, well, we are, uh, there is a package called Guillotina Redis Cache. This is, is quite, quite, a, quite a bit complex problem to, to fix. It's not perfect, but um, it works um, really fast. And at the end, uh, all the Guillotinas has a PubSub connection where they receive when an object gets invalidated, and so they need to retrieve again from the database. And uh, we also store the um, objects with a TTL on the Redis uh, if we to, to get them faster, the pickles. Indexing, um, there is a lot of things to, to explain about indexing. We have uh, the Elasticsearch plugin, it's really cool, and it works really well. At the end, we convert to JSON with a specific mechanism where you can define, can define indexes uh, uh, with uh, directives on the interface. And then 
uh, an Elasticsearch is on a post commit hook, and on Postgres is sent on the same commit. And then for security, on Elasticsearch, we're using access roles and access users that we are uh, ser um, defining for each object. Okay. All this backend thing, it's really nice. I have only five minutes, so I'm going to go a bit faster. Mm. We have a UI, thanks to Eric Briho, that it's really nice. You can log in, get uh, the database, get um, a container, and being able to, to browse like a ZMI, but the GMI. You can create new content here, and you can do whatever you want. Now I think it's down. But well, it's really nice. Uh, tomorrow we will show more about this on the Guillotina CMS, because there is also a rich text editor. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So which is the status? We know that there is uh, five co companies that are using it. We know uh, deployments that I think it's more than 20 million right now. It's nearly 30 million or 50 million objects that are deployed. We have 93% of code coverage. We are now in 4 to 11. We are uh, um, releasing five by the end of the year. There is a lot of documentation. There is a lot of tutorials. There is a Gitter channel. Um, there is two main repositories on GitHub called Guillotina Web and the Plume repository. And I want to do a really short demo of something specific. There is a repository called Guillotina Processing that opens, if you run it, opens a Jupyter notebook where there is some kind of interesting examples. It's just for uh, teaching guillotina, not, not for production, of course. Uh, this, this first notebook, it's about using the API in order to uh, push onto the system uh, a CSV file with a lot of articles. There is, I think, uh, this is a standard REST API, Plum REST API, we create a container, we uh, install the, an add-on, another add-on. We read a CSV file, and we push all the articles as documents on the system. And there is 2,579 uh, articles. So this is using the REST API, no strange thing. If you want to check, it's in the guillotine underscore processing. But the interesting one, it's the second one, the compute one, that we are able, since uh, Jupyter supports a sync IO, and recently in the last month, uh, you're able to start a guillotina inside the, the Jupyter. You can create an, the application. You can connect. We use this, this con, uh, context manager called Content API, sending the, which database you want to use. So you can do, uh, it opens a transaction, and getting out of the of it closes the transaction. And this this example goes through all the content and creates a machine learning model with TensorFlow and cares to classify news between uh, if it's uh, political or sport news. It's quite interesting. I think I have I'm running out of time, so I'm going just going to the last two slides. That's the roadmap and how, where, where I'm going to sprint. The, we have two main problems right now. One is the um, how to index uh, the security information and how to be able to search the security information without the need of re-indexing the children when we are changing the, um, the security information of OneNote. And we, we have some proof of concepts of ways of organizing the data on, on the indexer, so we don't need to um, to serialize everything to each object, and how to distribute more. The, we are reaching limits on, on the performance, and we want to be able to distribute 
the data on or sharding more on different systems. We have a lot of ideas on, on mine. We are going to try to do something with Rust and, and, and Raft. Zero time. So thank you. <laughs> Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, what Swagger version to export to then? Is like, is it exported uh, schema? Does it include the schemas of the content and all the validation validation fields, or is it just, just like a simple schema? Uh, I think it's the latest one. I, I'm not. You're able to see which. Uh, no, can you show no. me the YAML or the JSON file? Let's see. I think it's a separate file for me. No. Let's wait for it. I don't know why I have it. No, it's automatically. Everything is automatically generated, so I cannot show you if I cannot access it. I can show you later. But I think it's the latest version of Swagger because we are using the latest version of Swagger, the client. Can I, can I use, a, for example, a React Swagger library to generate a React client? Then yeah. you need to provide me a JSON or YAML file. Yeah, the problem is that this is traversal. It's based on traversal. So you need to change the path to define, to know which endpoints do you have on that path. So you cannot do that. You cannot. Uh, do automatically generating code, code because the, the definition depends on which uh, path you want to access to. Anybody <laughs> else have a question? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, what do you use on the, like between the, the code? And so do you use an ORM or how do you get things into the The, the ORM is something we built ourselves. Uh, based on persistent or persistent, we created something a bit different that uh, it's much thinner and uh, that allows to work with a sync IO um, point of view. Can I have another one? Anyone else? Oh, there's So a transaction started at the beginning of a request. How does the transaction system work? And as well as uh, it, the life cycle around persistence, if you have ghosts and these sorts of things. Yeah. The transaction starts after the traverse, after we get the view, just before the view, just before uh, executing the view, and just finish committed after the view. So we keep it as, as small as possible on time. And about the state of the objects, <coughs> we don't we don't have uh, ghosts. Uh, we are just um, the objects that are um, on on memory are getting validated and are linked to the, to the requ specific request that you are you are connected to. We have weak refer we have weak references to the to the objects, but we don't have the the concept that persistent or persistent have as ghosts. Um, so, uh, it's amazing what you've built, but I'm a bit afraid, I, like I'm asking myself why. For example, like you said, you, you have support for automatic table partitioning, but the, the official documentation for Postgres says until your tables are several hundred gigabytes long, you don't need table partitioning. You most probably don't need table partitioning. And you know, Pyramid can run with a async G unicorn workers, so what's like, Comparing to permit, what would be the main selling point? And if that is speed, then why didn't you use Go or Rust to write it? That's a really good question. M mainly because I didn't know Rust and Go. <laughs> so is the main selling point speed compared to permit, for example? The, the main selling point is the security system, for, from my point of view. 
uh, that we are using this traversal security system where we are inheriting the, that we are able to use the same kind of traversal pyramid doesn't have it uh, as as uh, the same way as we we we, are, we implemented as powerful out of the box. I don't know if it has evolved a lot during the last year, but um, and the asynchronous asynchronous are your one of the really cool features is that you can connect everything events to web sockets for example and so you you are modifying an object you are throwing a, 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 a modification of an object that is an event events are asynchronous here so you can plug a web socket to to connect this and send to another place any kind of information yeah. this kind of connections of asynchronous uh, input output is uh, is really powerful uh, well, there is a project where they are using a lot this this and mo mostly we reach at limits of uh, scalability with pyramid um, with uh, with uh, zoop and we try to go deep to tune it we were not able to make them faster maybe it was because we were not enough uh, experts on that technology and we needed something with a, a nice developer experience so python it's a good a good tool